Hello, everyone. Good evening, planet. <laughs> <laughs> Can anybody hear us? How about the comments and zero the looks, I'm 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 on, I'm on the feedback screen. It looks nice. I guess it's fine. I could hear you. I could hear myself. So welcome to the UbiPorts Q&A 126 um, with an unusual appearance of myself. Um, yeah, unfortunately, Marius is on sick leave and um, I was more than happy to jump in again. Um, and uh, here is Alfred, the big Hello. flipper. Yeah. <laughs> So um, I hope everybody is doing fine. We have uh, not so many news, but uh, a few very nice ones, of course. And uh, then we have to answer a few questions at the end. And yeah, we will just uh, talk as usual and make some some jokes about everything. So let's no. see where. No, <laughs> we not want to make jokes. <laughs> uh, hello, Amy, by the way, from the live chat. Um, how many people are there? I, don't, I didn't look. So I hope there are many, many live listeners already. Um, let's do it. Um, so there is um, OTF3 approaching, OTF3 for 2004. So I hope everybody is still fine with us restarting the OTA counter. But the beauty of that is just that, you know, this is a different OTA. It's not the usual one that you had for many, many years. So OTF3 for Focal is approaching. Um, I can say for myself because I'm still doing a bit in infra. We have we had some technical difficulties or still have because the build server's hard disk with I think two terabytes or so ran completely full last two weeks. And we have to purge a lot of builds of stuff that we did over the years because obviously we forgot to set up cleanup jobs for that. Very nice. Um, so by the way, means we cannot really build RC correctly. Now as I got it, we will have to clean this in the next days and then we can start shipping the first RC free candidate build, I guess. That's hopeful. Um, yes. And I just learned today that uh, building a uh, cute web engine, I guess it was, needs 100 gigabytes of free disk space. I don't know what the guy is uh, doing. Yeah. Uh, 100 gigabytes for a Chromium itself, but. Uh, yeah, for Chromium, Chromium itself, it was this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whoa. yeah. I mean, guys, what are you doing? What's the browser today? Yeah. <laughs> It's an OS. <laughs> yes, it's an operating system. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> so, auto is on the way. Um, yeah, uh, what else? Alfred, give us some bits and bytes. Yeah, well, uh, for the Qt web engine, thanks for mentioning that even, uh, there are some, some, or at least one very important revert over the last few weeks, and that is the re reverting the hardware accelerated video decoding patch back to its previous state. Uh, we found a few crashes, uh, or Rachanan found a few crashes here, which caused us to go back and revert it to the state that, that it was on with OTA2. It should still be a little bit better because we have changed uh, uh, some parts in LibHybris, and um, LibHybris based crashes that, that were at that level of the, of the stack. And Qt web, Qt web Engine itself will receive the treatment uh, when it's ready. So hardware accelerated video decoding, it's it's already there. It's not hitting the frame rate as as fluently as it could. That's the problem with it. Uh, but as soon as we get the crashes fixed, you can be you can rest assured that 60 frames 4K are 60 frames 4K videos. And uh, until that, you will have to enjoy the the 4K videos with lower frame rate for now. But we will make sure to get this sorted out really quickly. Yeah, awesome. I mean, um, we are always open that if something doesn't really work nicely, um, we are fine to revert it and try try it in a in a later time to bring it back. It's the better approach for us all, probably. Um, yeah, wonderful. Um, I guess there is a lot of other things that changed in OT3 still. Um, I don't have a uh, change look now, but I guess we will talk about the OT3 anyways on the next Q&A or the next next one. So there will be more details what's contained 
Yes, actually, yes, you, you can. Actually, we do have a very interesting change coming up with uh, change logs, and that is um, presenting all the merged MRs over GitLab in a readable, st uh, in a human readable way. Uh, just a short description of it, and we can attach that to the OTA releases. So it, I think Mike did that. Uh, so or Sunweaver for those who 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 already know him or who don't know him. Um, has brought up this this uh, little script that brings all the uh, GitLab stuff, the changes, into one little file. And we can maybe put that somewhere in the release notes when it's ready. I'm pretty sure that's, that's the plan. So let's see where this goes. And that means you will know what's inside, so that not only the cook knows what is has been cooked. <laughs> there were, I remember this, there were demands since 2017, actually, that we publish a roadmap, we publish what we're doing, what changed in every build, and we always said, guys, it's so hard to do, because to be really serious, so many changes in so many places, um, we cannot really um, compile that list for every, every release or every developer or RC release. We, we, we do a stable release and then we have a big overall change log and things like that. But of course, uh, by time, um, we got a little bit more convinced that it would make sense to have more details also in a more, how to say, automated way to collect actual information from the merge requests. And I guess it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And um, we probably overlooked over time a few changes that we should have published and we should have told people that they are in by just manually not paying attention enough to what's changed in the last cycle. So having this thing in at least in a semi-automatic way land in the, in the official change logs would be very nice. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Even not for maybe fully automated. Cool. So I guess that's for the OTA. There is not much more to say than um, guys. Yes, it's on the way. Um, also, let's remember ourselves that the uh, OTA um, is, is done via the RC channel first so you will be invited to test everything of course and uh, we stopped also now quite a long time ago already to have automatic rcs every week so don't panic if you don't see any change in the rc channel because we say ota3 is coming well it's going to be pushed manually and at that point in time um, you will be able to install that via normal update or changing the channel otherwise stay unstable <laughs> <sighs> Yes. Before RC releases, sometimes devil is a bit crazy. So, <laughs> just <Yeah>. saying. <laughs> okay. Or to put it in a pun, the devil's in the detail. Haha. The devil's in the details. <laughs> okay. Good. Um, shall I take the news about Walla phones and Hollowell system, sure. which we also published already a bit on our news channel? So, uh, there are actually two noteworthy news from um from Hollowell Systeme who is um uh, who is producing and um uh, creating the volophone for us um the first thing is that uh, they are really doing now a 10 euro donation for every uh device sold um during was it october i guess uh there's still some time some days left so if you ever thought about having uh, a volophone that might be the perfect uh, mouth to buy one because uh, you will immediately support uh, the foundation. Yeah, um, that's a really cool thing, and um, so we encourage you go to the shop and buy a wallet phone immediately. Yeah, because we will have our ten euros immediately <laughs> on our accounts. Um, and the second thing is that there is a raffle um, where you can actually win such a wallet phone without uh, paying anything. Um, if you would go on uh, our start page or our blog page, um, also in the news channel, there was a, a news post about it, um, that there is um, definitely some question, um, actually three questions about the Ubuntu Touch and U reports, and um, you will be able uh, to win um, the black and white version of the flagship model Walla 22, if you answer them correctly. 
Um, and you're sending this uh, via email, so this is very easy. Everybody can do this. Everybody can participate. No bells and whistle attached. Um, it would be really great if we have many participants in that. Yeah? So this is the first time that we have um, something like that, where you can actually win a prize yeah, when you show your knowledge. And um, so I would invite you to do it and try it out if you really want to own that phone. Yeah? And uh, please don't try to win it and just then resell it pre-installed with Ubuntu Touch on eBay. Yeah? We don't want to see it there. Yeah? It will stop working. Yeah? <laughs> I, if I ever see this phone being resell, resold uh, immediately after you got it, then it will just go dark and display a text. This phone is not for sale. <laughs> it's, the, it's the raffle phone. It costs $2,000. <laughs> you can unlock it with a donation to the Uberts Foundation. <laughs> no, of course, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's not possible. Technically not possible. So these two, uh, these two things uh, from... Uh, from our friends at Hello World System, thank you very much. Um, it's a real pleasure that you are supporting us for so many years already now. Um, being the one uh, small vendor in Germany uh, or um, actually around the planet that uh, continuously tries to um, get Ubuntu touch on the devices as much as possible. Give this phone to Amy immediately. Well, um, that would be actually also a cool text. Yes, of course. <laughs> Please add your postal address. Is this some All reverse right. psychology type of stuff? <laughs> <laughs> Don't give it to Amy. Oh, okay. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Maybe there's a hypnosis mode inside and start spinning some colors and then... A hypnosis uh, mode or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to go wild again here. Actually, yeah. anti theft protection. The, the, the phone starts to hypnotize you to not steal it. Yeah? That would be actually a cool <laughs> mode. It realizes I'm being stolen. I'm trying to prevent it with just talking my way out. <laughs> You know that the Libhybris um, hardware composer test suite has a test application that draws a yes, yes, spinning that circle, one. A spinning hypnosis. That's a good start. Let's let's try it out. Let's make a lab for that. Let's make it the lock screen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, speaking of lab, um, you have something in the lab for us? Yeah, totally. Uh, and that is drum roll. Q6 uh, experiments with Ubuntu Touch um, in a click package. So the first, um, let's call it, attempt to get Q6 running on Ubuntu Touch is with my little other side project called Tides, uh, which I've shown in the past, which I massively talk about on Twitter al uh, almost. And it's it's a WebAssembly, C++, and C IDE. And now I've started to take it as a test bed for porting it over to Ubuntu Touch in a click package. Now, why this application? Because Tide is inherently based on Qt 6. It starts with Qt 6. And right now, I'm, yeah, Tide F FTW. That's, I agree with that, especially for the icon. I wonder who that, who did that. So um, we have Qt 6 base tied here, which is very like light, uh, white type of application. But here we can see something uh, <laughs> blinded by the light. I'm trying to find the something. Oh, yes, I can see something, actually. You're right. Yeah, yeah, right. So as you can see, it has this little rotation bug, uh, which I still need to figure out, where it when you rotate the screen and it should resize the... The, the window, it does resize the window because the app notices, hey, I'm now in landscape. Now turn it somewhere else, like tilt it the other way. And you can see it has this little animation there and it still shows this this side mm. um, completely transparent. I suppose that's, yeah, when you like, take a look at that, it it just draws the background, the black mm -hmm. background. Um, <laughs> Still needs to be figured out what's going on here, but it's a first step. And it's based on the upstream libhybris integration into Qt Wayland. So Qt Wayland does have some Qt 5 based um, code there, which I had to patch up so that uh, it builds. And now it seems working pretty well. 
uh, other than this rotation issue, and it's still it's still basically in a click, so it's not in in the in the operating system shipped with the OS. Um, but it's a start, and mm -hmm. it's my personal start. I try to gain some knowledge from that and bring that over to the team. Uh, when the time to migrate over to Qt6 comes, it will also uh, probably cause me to patch a few content hub things because this inherently allows to import data from other applications on iOS at least. And I want to have a similar fe like feature parity type of thing with Ubuntu Touch as well. If this works mm -hmm. out, then we will have Qt6 based content hub earlier than uh, a Qt6 based Ubuntu Touch release. So, I mean, we will probably have to do a split for a short period of time anyway, or at least in the, in the midterm, because even though Qt is a big package to ship with an OS, um, we might have to ship some Qt5 for some time as well especially for app compatibility and uh, how we're going to solve that. I'm not mm. really sure. Um, we don't have much of a plan here. So this is just a little sneak peek and first dabblings into the Qt6 land. Um, but it looks like it's going somewhere at least, and at least it, it allows me to draw things on the screen and actually have the application run um, within, an, uh, within a night, within a day of work. And Ooh, you're so awesome. You're so, a much better yeah. developer than I am. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, it's it's well, it's mostly the, the cute um, POSIX and macOS and iOS things. They have been abstracted beforehand, but the the task, quote unquote, of making sure that it works with Qt six in a click package, this was around a night uh, of work mm -hmm. uh, because the abstractions were already already there. And, um, well, with that, I'm pretty sure that I will be able to talk about a few more Qt6 experience in the, in the future. Great, great, great. That's really cool. Um, by the way, I just have to mention, I guess uh, Wayland uh, has still, uh, sorry, Waydroid has still also the rotation bug because oh. I accidentally rotated the Waydroid on my old. Actually, that was, it's quite a long time ago. I think it was on the on the 1604 base still, but uh, it had the same thing that somehow uh, we didn't tell our lineage container that it's being rotated. Yeah, I we hope do. we have fixed it already. We do or did have something uh, regarding that. I'm not really 100% mm -hmm. sure how the status of uh, Waydroid sensor integration mm -hmm. is, to be honest. Um, my use of Waydroid like, is reduced down to WhatsApp and some banking. Uh, without rotation, and I don't need to, like, I mm. don't need rotation in my WhatsApp or banking app, so... <laughs> no, you really definitely don't want me. to do this. <laughs> no. <laughs> but for oh, games, yeah. other things, it would be interesting, right? Mm -hmm. I tried to pair my... I actually tried to activate my dishwashers uh, app, which is... Um, household appliances also have apps these days, yes. yes. And the interesting thing is that the dishwasher has absolutely no user interface despite a few small signals and LEDs and stuff. Guess what? That thing has just Bluetooth and Wi-Fi built in. You start the Bluetooth with long press a button. Then the Android app needs to pair actually via Bluetooth to that device send over the Wi-Fi connection information, then this thing starts to be in the Wi-Fi. And from there on, I could start my dishwasher from the other end of the planet, but I don't understand why I should do this. <laughs> so if people, if somebody can explain me why you would remote start your dishwasher when you're not at home, um, when you still can set it up already with a manual push of a button to delay it for one hour, two hours, three hours or so, whatever, which I do sometimes. So I say, okay, okay I'm going to watch that stuff. When I get home, uh, it's ready. Or I started at 4 a.m. in the morning yeah, so that it's ready in the morning. No problem with that. Yeah, I like the time delayed um, actions in household mm -hmm. devices, like also a washing machine. But no, I don't want to start it remotely from my app. First of all, I will forget yeah, if this is manual start. If I do, if I supposed to do this during my work day, and then I forget it, I come home and the dishes are still dirty. Yeah? So no. Yeah? Mm. <laughs> Sometimes it really seems people wanted to put apps out there for everything. 
but uh, nevertheless, I tried it out. It's it's nice, um, but it's completely useless. Yeah, so <laughs> that that would have been something that I could stuff into my weight, right? But um, if there is no more features like this, yeah, I would love to see, for example, how many cycles did it have? Yeah, uh, were there any problems detected? You know, and guess what? The first thing the thing was doing when it connected to Wi-Fi was a firmware update, because it started to light up weirdly and I'm looking into the app, what, what is going on now? And it's written, written there, oh, you need to install a security um, firmware update for your dishwasher. It's being downloaded now. And two minutes later, it was flashing. I was thinking, okay, if this thing gonna breaks now, I'm not going to wash any dishes next week. Okay. Isn't Too much talking about my dishwasher, but it's a fun episode, I guess. Huh? Isn't it funny that a dishwasher can have exploits and viruses nowadays? Yes. And that really makes me a bit scared. Yeah. So, can we please have Ubuntu Touch for appliances? <laughs> yeah. Basically, um, Canonical has that idea uh, with with all that thing that goes into IoT uh, efforts. Huh? Um, but then also device vendors like uh, big trademarks, they should or they, they would have to adopt that. Yeah. I don't know what they're doing, if they're hacking their own stuff for the dishwasher's firmware or if there's a Linux installed. Now I'm curious, actually. I have questions. Yeah? <laughs> so Because if it's standard hardware, probably it's also standard software. Who knows? Yeah? Yeah. Using Pixel 3 Thanks for the comment from the live chat. Yeah, This I'm going to show you. Yeah? Oh, yes, you could stuff a whole smartphone into the dishwasher's uh, side <laughs> or so. Yeah, and then... <laughs> <laughs> um, by the way, I saw a comment uh, about me having banking in Waydroid, and yeah, I do at the moment. I hope it stays for that as long, like that, as long as possible. Um, but right now, I do have the ability to do banking with my uh, with my bank. App. Until the bank runs out, they will terminate his account immediately. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's actually a special thing, right? Because uh, I could I couldn't do this with my bank. Uh, we are living in the same country. We are basically living in the same city. We have different banks. There are yeah. different rules apply. For some reason, his bank is um, more generic uh, or generic. How to say? Um, more open. More open to to not locking down the app so much that all the security parameters must be met. Yeah. So, yeah. There, it's always worth a try. If you're if you're curious if something works with Vader or not, please try it yourself. There is no general rules. You have to install well, app by app and see what works and what not. Right. Good. Um, so actually, we are um, twenty three minutes into the show. I would start a little bit sponsor message if I actually can find the right button. Because I was thinking we try out what we discovered today. We can play music in this wonderful live streaming thingy. So let's try background music called Feeding the Ducks. And I guess that, that fits perfectly fine to the sponsor message. Yeah. How does this sound? Yeah. So, oh yeah. That actually sounds like Feeding the Ducks. I can yeah. definitely understand. <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. So we thank our primary sponsors uh, as usual. This is Smooth, Wola, Pine64, Infrastructure Sponsors, DigitalOcean, CloudRun, Netlify, and Gandhi.net. And um, I guess it's a bit too loud now. I will make this a little bit more quiet. And there is a list of patrons here. I guess they are updated because this list sounds new to me. And I always read patrons in Q&As. And was thinking, are those people still donating or not? You will, so, you will like one of them very much. I will wait for your response for the, for the special name that I have in my mind. Go okay, um, let me go over this quickly and let me uh, misspell your name the next time. So please become a patron. Patrons, Heather Ellsworth, Christian Jekyll, Rondarius, Spendierhose. That's actually cool, Spendierhose. Thank you very much. PK, Kenneth Chu, Daniel Franchak, Robin Hood, Edo Thiel, Tefitson Gardner and Associates Consulting Inc. Tixia, JT and Will Atwood. Very what? nice. Huh? But Spendierhose, you made you made a big shout out for Spendierhose. That's the that's the name of the day. Yeah. <laughs> so if you wanna support us and uh, our silly comments on that show, um, please go to ubewards.com/slash/donate and find a way to get. Uh, 
rid of your money into our pockets. Uh, we would be very much appreciated. So feeding the ducks is over, actually. Nice. Good. It stopped when I was finished with my list. Oh, it's coming back. Uh, you looped it. Yeah. <laughs> Go away. We have enough ducks still to fit. <laughs> Next time. So um, we come over to the questions part of the show, as usual, roughly after half an hour or so. And uh, in my notes, I see there is a, a thing that was unanswered from the last week. And uh, we should do a technical deep dive on that question. Is that still what we should do? Yeah, totally. Um, um, okay. Because last week I uh, was um, sleeping while the Q&A was, was being recorded. Uh, um, so, like, um, yeah, let's start with the tec technical deep dive here. So what uh, has been brewing over the last few weeks, months, uh, has been some integration, reintegration of SnapD into Ubuntu Touch and making sure that Snaps can be installed. Um, there have been a few questions last week and starting off with this, with this deep dive, there is the question, what are the main differences between snap and click, uh, the size dependencies and the distribution basically, um, is very much of a difference here. So snaps are a spiritual continuation of click, meaning that everything that has been learned from click uh and has been done on click was is has now transitioned over into what is now called snaps and it's basically taking over what what they learned and what they wanted to improve at canonical and bring over those technology things to a new base and new land and uh, new ways of connecting applications together um the it, the idea with snaps is that interfaces plugs and slots are very modular in that sense that an application can provide an interface and the other application can consume those functionalities through that interface that has been connected and um, snaps also have dependencies either shipped with the application or there's also the ability to put it in a in a content snap i believe is the proper term um, and the distribution mechanism is through the snap store primarily um, this this means that the size and of the dependencies is going to um, like and you need to take care of as an application developer at least you need to take care of your dependencies and uh, don't put the burden of dependencies over to the user but it also means duplicating storage from time to time um, which can be solved by using those content snaps, uh, making sure that libraries are pulled into the environment from other snaps. Um, was there a need for snap? What can snap bring to Ubuntu Touch is another question. And snaps and the open store, are they compatible to each other? Um, basically, uh, the... The, the need for Snap was basically to bring over those functionalities of, of click over to a newfound uh, land and IoT and um, like bringing over, bringing over the atomic update mechanism to a new, uh, to new basis of the OS. So atomic basically means you install an application and it either installed or it did not install, in which case you either revert back or you don't install it at all. Um, either it's there or it's not. That's the promise of, of uh, Atomic Updates. And what can Snap bring to Ubuntu Touch? Well, if you ask me personally, and the reason why I do it is mainly for those applications that we can't uh, provide in a phone setup or can't use much in a phone setup because no matter how much you try to shoehorn a GTK for non-convergent application, I'm not talking about GTK for convergent applications, but those desktop applications, as long as you try to put those on a little phone screen, uh, they're not going to be very useful with, the, with just a finger. And all the applications that don't fall into the group of, oh, that should be in the open store, is basically the Snap Store. And that's what I wanted to bring over. 
uh, with CLI applications, with um, desktop applications, with applications that are actually convergent too. Um, because there are some, Tide is one example. And uh, it's not mainly a Ubuntu Touch app, but rather a more general, okay, here is a, a desktop Linux, Ubuntu, whatever, Debian even uh, type of system, and you can run it. And I, I think we should profit off of that as well because we, we want applications to run on our software as well. And that's the main reason why I focused on it. And Snaps and the open store being compat uh, compatible to each other, I think there were some similarities in the back end. I'm not really 100% sure anymore how that looks. Um, but uh, the compatibility between Snaps and the open store, sure, it could be integrated, but that's something that you would have to talk with open store folks uh, about. Um, in theory, it's much, it's not much of an issue to, to include it uh, as a feature, uh, minus the, the work that needs to be done. But for until that happens, I intend to make the Snap Enabler application that I started, the Snapser, um, making sure that Snapser also it becomes a Snap Store. So you can't pronounce it like... Uh, like a drunk person would pronounce Snap Store. Uh, I installed it from the Snap Store, and <laughs> and uh, the application itself will receive that functionality sooner or later. Um, but for now, it's just an enabler. Um, I will make sure to bring that functionality in as soon as possible. But it's not there yet. And the I think that is. Pretty much it for the start of it. There are. I will just try to run through the questions from re eighty eight here from last week. Um, in the last Q and A, Q &A uh, Alfred said that there is that at the moment snaps can't replace Libertine because there are things in Libertine that UT needs to stay feature complete. Yes, and the uh, basic idea is that Libertine is good for what it does, and Snap is not providing the same functionality at the moment. Um, applications don't run as well in snaps right now as they could because they're not integrated into the system at all pro properly right now, not using libhybris properly, not using uh, the hardware properly. And as soon as that is fixed, I'm pretty sure that it will, that it will exceed the capabilities of Liberty. Um, but for now, since so many people want to install dApps and we won't allow it in the root of S by default, uh, they can install devs in Libertine, and that's pretty much where it's uh, where the Libertine and Snap split is at the moment. Um, are you collaborating, talking with Canonical or Snapcrafters about Snap support on UT? Um, I'm I'm definitely in contact with with a few uh, Canonical folks and Snapcraft people, and actually next month, or starting next month at the Ubuntu Summit, I will be there talking about bringing snap crafting abilities to a tablet environment. And I do that with Ubuntu Touch, showcasing how Ubuntu Touch does it versus an um, Apple iPad and how, did, how those devices, even though one is way more powerful, how it cannot provide the same functionality that Ubuntu Touch can do right now for that task. And I'm pretty sure that there will be folks from Canonical who are also interested. If not, then I'm going to be sad, but <laughs> not much. Um, so yeah, I am in contact with, with a few Canonical folks here. And I'm pretty sure, I'm, and I'm also, if you want to follow the, the, the adventure, you can also follow it on the Snapcraft forums. There is a thread or there are separate threads now where I talk about the progress of Ubuntu Touch and bringing it, uh, bringing Snap capabilities over. Uh, SnapD, and then going on to the next question, SnapD and Snaps already work on a read-only system called Ubuntu Core. Why in UT SnapD needs a writable system? Will this be solved? Uh, yes, this will be solved. The, the reason why you need to mount uh, the system read-write at the moment using Snapser is because it's just not pre-installed. SnapD is not part of the Ubuntu rootfs at the moment. 
And whenever that will be the case, I don't know. But um, for now, you will have to install SnapD through apt or through Snapser, which in turn calls apt and pulls two packages over, which don't, which should not break the system at all. Um, but it's that's the part of it being experimental. It's not finished yet. It's not there yet. It's just one way of approaching the um, the support. And hypothetically speaking, how much work is needed to have Lumiri packaged as a snap and working on an all snap OS? Well, that's probably going to be a lot of work. <laughs> and it probably needs some, in, some talking with Snapcraft, or not Snapcraft, with uh, Snap D uh, developers who um, provide or who want to. If they want that, want to have that as well, you you're more than welcome to get in touch with me. But it will probably need some talking with them to provide some interfaces um, for communication between individual um, snap-based operating system parts. So Lomiri itself doesn't do much. It also needs other processes in the background to run and do things with it together, like the indicators. And like some system, uh, by let other system level components, and that way it could in theory be the universal OS uh, that we all dreamed dreamed about because um, snaps providing a desktop uh, desktop environment, a whole shell, a whole desktop environment uh, as easily installable as they would have ever been or would ever be just with one command on a multitude of operating systems, that sounds like a cool idea indeed. And if that's one way to distribute Lomiri to, to users, I don't see much of an issue here. Um, but it's not on the plate yet. It's not a plan. And we will see where this goes. And I think with that, we're done with the Snapcraft and Snap-based questions now. I guess there will be always more questions because it's a very, very complex topic, of course. And yeah. uh, over the years, um, we always had these or that explanations for why we still think that click is relevant and so, but we always said also, we, we want to have uh, alternatives. We want to explore and, and try out what we, wanna, what we can do with it. Yeah. And here were a, were a few perfect examples uh, why Snap would be cool. And um, yes, there was a comment in the chat saying that uh, that we put basically only convergent apps into the open store. That would be an interesting uh, stance. Um, on the other hand, we have a few really, really useful apps that are not convergent. So I don't know if we want to distract them. <laughs> but yeah. uh, ultimately, if we say this is the mission goal that uh, we only have convergent apps because we want to also have them on the desktop and they should work in the same way and, and so on and so on. Yeah, well, it's something for the future, I guess. Yeah, Not for now. Right. Yeah, and for those that, that are interested, yes, the, because of the technical uh, details, yes, indeed, we do run uh, op an operating system with security mechanisms that are already in place inside of SnapD and that SnapD makes use of, like AppArmor, SecComp, and other technologies that allow sandboxing, even UDEF-based rules. And um, with that... The technical abilities of Ubuntu Touch are there for the basics, which allows people to run LibreOffice and GIMP and whatnot of, of Ubuntu Touch in a conversion setup. But it's not hardware accelerated. It's not integrated into the system properly. You can't easily share data with apps that are usually convergent. And for mm. that, there needs to be a solution uh, implemented in the long run. Maybe, maybe um, XDG portals maybe, or making that work with Content Hub in making the Content Hub UI basically just a layer on top of um, the XTG portals thing uh, that is out there. Mm. Um, but again, it, it all needs, it needs more helping hands. And right now I'm the only one working on it. So there have been a few people testing it and playing around with it. Uh, but if more people would be interested in helping that effort, then please get in touch with me, ask on Telegram at UbiPorts, and let's see where this goes. All right, thank you for the very detailed explanation and uh, to 
fix the spillover from the last show. Uh, we are staying a bit in, in this area because there are other questions now that I see uh, perfectly fit on that topic. Uh, the first one is, uh, what, are, what are the core apps that uh, are still being missed from Focal? Um, that's a good question. Theoretically, no core apps are missing because all the core apps should be in, in uh, Focal because they are core apps, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but there is a definition of core apps by the users and core apps by the developer side. Core app basically meaning what's all that's installed when you ship the phone. So it's a technical um, term in some way. Yeah. But from the usability point of view, of course, um, I would pat my shoulder and say Teleports is a very core-ish app yeah, because uh, it's very important and key to communication for a lot of people. Um, I honestly don't know what's still missing for me. Um, there is one bug that bugs me a lot about um, web apps uh, crashing when location is being switched on. In, in Yeah. Intro. And if this would be fixed, for example, it would unblock a few things, yeah? um, like my commuter uh, app or my, my public transport app here for Vienna. That's sometimes very useful. I only need it maybe one day in a month, but then I would need it quickly to find out where I can catch the next train to this or that. Yeah? And when I'm here on this position, I'm mostly not even waiting for the, for the geolocation, but that thing turns it just on. Okay, I could refuse it. And then immediately goes out of service. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I guess those apps that still have issues, either they cannot run properly or we actually do not have someone that uh, converts them into focal, there are still a few out there. Yeah. Um, we just can shout out for, please find uh, yourself or somebody else that wants to code a bit. Um Get, becoming at least a temporary maintainer for some apps, trying to bring them over to Focal. Yeah? Uh, we lost a lot of people contributing in the early days to, to Xenial apps, and they were already gone some years ago. Yeah? But the app was stable, the app was in the store, everybody could use it. Now we transition to Focal and nobody's actually updating those small but, but nice and beautiful uh, apps that are still missing. I get it. But uh, we really need more hands for that. And sometimes it's not much to do. Yeah. But we do have some interesting developments now that I open the open store app here again and show the, the new and updated apps. There are mm -hmm. great apps being updated all the time, even including um, Passes app, which I was looking forward to very much. Um, like uh, a Tesla application, uh, uh, currency converters and other mm. applications that have been around that were not there. And Macefish, for example, is also one of those applications that have been brought over that found new maintainer, it seems, mm. uh, especially new development for Ubuntu Touch, if I remember correctly. Um, so there are certain things happening with, with applications overall, though uh, it's just can we find people, as, as Florian yeah. said, who, who would like to help us? Uh, the original uh, question here also contains that um, uh, notice that at least two core apps are still missing in focal notes and UT tweak tool. Okay, yeah, that, that UT tweak tool, I must say we should do this as soon as possible because that's right. a really useful thing. Yeah. Right. Um, there is um, just a note partially answered by Lionel last week. I don't, I don't know what he answered. Um, but uh, yeah, I would answer probably in the same way as he did. <laughs> <laughs> what apps do you consider important uh, that you want app developers to focus on them? Um, no, I, d I wouldn't say really focus on something. There, there is so much still to uh, explore, either bringing, as we said, apps from uh, Xenia to Focal or developing new uh, interesting apps. Don't focus on a certain area. Um, we want to have some. We, we want to have all the apps that we can get. Yeah. So I agree. Um, the more the more widespread uh, app support we have, or or, or app, app creativity got wild, and uh, everybody implements something that they think is useful only for themselves, but maybe finds other users that will increase the user base. So um, somebody once said in software development, the best software that you would write is the one that actually fix, fixes a problem that you have. Yeah? Yeah. Don't to think too much about the problems of other people and how you're going to do stuff for them because then you are in a sales perspective. Mm -hmm. Since we are in open source space, it's always hard to say. 
I develop something that others need, maybe even if I'm not motivated to do it, you will sustain for the first two or three months. You bring the first version of the app into the App Store, and then the users will come with feedback and they say, look, I want to have this and this, and this should be different. And actually, you did it in the wrong way like this, because that should be much more like this. Um, as long as you're not selling software and making a living out of it, yeah, it will frustrate you. Yeah? yeah. The best apps are the ones that you use yourself quite frequently. Try to focus on them. Try to develop something awesome from your own ideas and creativity, and then see if you find a user base for it. Yeah, that and keeps you motivated over years. Huh? That's basic. That's basically my approach to things. I, yeah. I mean, it sounds egotistical, but it 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 needs to be egotistical because you are your own worst critic. And if you find yes. something that annoys you, and if you fix it, then it fixes it for others immediately. Also, right? Yeah. Others benefit off of the of your ego, uh, egotistical um, like shenanigans with software, and that's pretty yeah. much what what can drive you. Um, if you feel unmotivated to do it, right? The next question fits perfectly. We have the right orders. I, I'm so grateful for preparation of questions being done in, in a topical order, kind of, yeah? <laughs> uh, Beowulf is asking, I would like to ask in which parts, features, modules of UT uh, development developers are most needed? And uh, now we could say everywhere, but of course, that's a very generic answer. But um, in case you're new to Ubuntu Touch, maybe going into the app space first is not a bad idea because core development is hard in some areas, less documented than everything else. But for apps, we have really cool app development guides now. We have a lot of community that can help out. And I guess with the latest tool chain that we have for app development, that covers a lot of things already. Yeah? So there, there are still manual steps. You still have to understand what you're doing. But you can really focus in some points already on just creating the code for your actual app and not so much fiddling around, uh, learning the SDK and doing stuff. Yes, it's still complex, but um, onboarding into Ubuntu Touch maybe could be via um, this app ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's something that uh, brings in more people than before because we focused first always on, oh, we need more code developers, we need more maintainers for the real uh, important parts. We need to drive that forward. And we have a good, uh, or we had a, a really good um, um, st stable base before we started the focal transition where we just had a few loopholes over time. Um, and now that's going to be straightened out. But I guess we, we saw now with the uh, signal to focal transition, we need also more app developers. It's not only about core developers. Yes, there's also right. a problem. Yeah, You can also become a core developer out of being an app developer, but maybe onboarding via app development is easier. I guess so. That's just what I thought now in the last five minutes. So don't don't blame me if it's completely not the case. Yeah, but I just thought I have this theory now. <laughs> yeah, right. No, but uh, I agree uh, to the part that well, we do need people everywhere, right? We, there, the, this yeah. project is so big compared to the resources that are available to us, to the people working on it. Um, yeah, that's. We need help regardless. The point is where to start, where are people most needed? And I wouldn't ask that from a starting contributor. I would rather ask them, where would you like to, where, where would you like to start? Find, mm -hmm. go, just, and if it's just scrolling through GitLab and randomly picking one, stopping the scroll at a random place, and that's it. Um, Read up a little a little bit on the on the project that are included uh, in in GitLab, and mm. if the, the if there is something that is, for example, you're a Python developer, and oh, by the way, there is a Python thing, um, or a Go developer. Oh, look at this! There is I don't know. There are pretty much a lot of Go based packages there, um, like the push notification stuff. If I oh remember. yeah. You can talk with me about my experiences in, Go <laughs> in that area. Sometimes the choice of the... On the server side, I fully agree. We have our push server running in Go with an uptime of, I think, more than two years. That thing just never restarts, only when we really, really need to do it for an update yeah. or so. Um, I have seen really uh, a lot of software, but Go seems to be, in from a service point of view, or the, the unmaintained... Um, 
code base that always just is resilient. It's really good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I cannot complain on the client side. Hmm, maybe not so much, but okay. <laughs> All right. Super. Then there is a last fitting question because in the live chat now we had a question from Michael from Cleveland or Michael Cleveland. If this is your family name, then um, excuse me that I was thinking you are from Cleveland. Maybe both is true. Um, we know the misery of uh, UT in, in US because you basically cannot use it in any places anymore without 3G. And we don't support uh, Volte. And now we are at the Volte point of the show again. I don't know if you had Volte discussions in last Q and A's, but of course it's also a very important topic. Yeah. Mm. Um, the, I combine this with the other question on my list, the last one, um, asking because Sailfish seems to have now Volte support uh, on the Xperia 10 free. Um, would it make sense to create a UPD port for the device and join forces? Well, it sounds very nice. The only problem is that. Uh, Yola actually has an NDA with Sony about that to use certain parts that are uh, vendor specific uh, for getting Volta uh, to work. And I don't think we will be allowed to use them. Yeah. Right. The whole discussion with those Volta are, is, a, yeah. Those are closed down uh, pieces. These are how to access the vendor blobs and basically as a decompilation or uh, an interface description that they need. Uh, to to really get the thing running, and we had uh, this idea also, yeah. But the really ultimate problem with Volta is it's proprietary to the bone, and nobody wants to share code about it how it works. Right. Yeah? And we could reverse engineer and invest so and so much time. the The small positive thing is that if we get the Pine phones running, we would have a gap closer here at least for some time. Right. And then I want to thank again Oren, uh, who might or might not watch the show now or later. He is now driving uh, the effort to get uh, OTA updates for the Pine phones going. Very um, nice. We have still to untangle a few things, but it seems that when we could finally somehow flash the part, which is of course made differently than on the Android phones, uh, um, or just switch over to the other file what we downloaded. We could have OTA for PinePhone, and then with that, we could finally start to promote it in a, in a more aggressive way, let's say. Yeah, yeah. and it would work uh, because the Volta, the modem there has Volta built in with all the bits and pieces needed, and it just has a few commands that you need to send over, and it's completely autonomously handling Volta calls. In contrast to what Android has on, on most Android hardware, what happens there? Yeah. yeah. So that's that's the thing that we would focus for the moment, I guess, rather than uh, debugging and uh, decrypting uh, hundred thousand lines of code. And it's Java code, by the way. It's really yeah. really boring to do it. Um, still, we will not we will not forget about this fully. But the more promising thing is for the people that need Volta. Um, let's see if we can get the Pine Phone running for you. And I had the PinePhone Pro in hands uh, on this year's Fostem, and I was really amazed. Yeah? The PinePhone's uh, fluidity, the the the, the screen, um, and so on, is is really on a level with a medium Android phone uh, of the current generations. Um, low to medium range, of course, it's not high class, not not one of the biggest, um, how to say. <clears throat> ships on the market flagship you, yeah. flagships you can really work with that thing so, so i was carrying this around uh, on this one day on fostem and showed it around i was really amazed there yeah? so mm -hmm. i must say that they learned a lot from the from the first pine phone which was a little bit hard for us to follow on but um if they still continue producing it which, which i hope um and we can get water running there and the otas perfect then we have it Fuse Team has a very interesting question uh, or point here to make, and that is uh, Fuse Team saying, uh, I, th I still think SIP integration could help bridge the gap, and I agree with that. Uh, also, yes, yes. That mm -hmm. would be another mm -hmm. approach for those who do not want to trust those um, those pieces that make up the, the whole voice over LTE functionality. Um, but it needs integration into the OS. It needs certainly some work to mm -hmm. be integrated. And I have been asked to to help here, but I I'm, I don't want to spread myself too thin. I'm not going to do it alone. I, yes. I will have to say this out loud right now. 
And uh, just recently, because I had somebody that uh, desperately tried to call me uh, on my Telegram account, and of course, uh, my Ubuntu Touch phone didn't get it. And then I opened the phone and then I have missed call, missed call, missed call. I was thinking, uh. oh, people now really think because I'm on Telegram, they can call me there. Well, um, what am I going to do about this now? And I couldn't even call back immediately because there was no phone number. Um, we had to rearrange this a bit. Uh, then I said, okay. Maybe it's not really time that we uh, try to implement calls into teleports. That would be really awesome. That's the same. That, that's the span of things. It's the same what Alfred now said for for SIP stuff, and um, maybe there are other voice over IP applications. Um, we need to really change the infrastructure there. Uh, Ubuntu Touch is not very friendly to alternative uh, voice, let's say, applications and stacks other than the telephony stack that we have now. But if you can diversify this in some way, and we also could help need help here, yes. Mm -hmm. um, please send your CV and um, that you will work for free for the next ten years <laughs> to our email address. Um, no, and I must say, <laughs> no. And I must say, unfortunately, a, 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 um, let's say a rather a rather a good knowledge of C plus plus might be helpful, yeah, because mm -hmm. all these when it gets to these low level parts in interfaces and also with third party applications. It's mostly C and C++. Mm. All the other fancy languages, unfortunately, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's actually the thing. Well, uh, we are through and we still have four minutes left. Yeah. Um, let's take one quick question from the live chat. I just can show it from here. Is support for Pixel 6, 7, 8 planned? Yes, please send your Pixel 6, 7 and 8 to my home address and... Um, Allow me for the next three years to port them. No, maybe it's not the best way. Um, no. How it works normally is what we said before for the software applies also to hardware and porting. If you like a device as a, as a developer, as a porter, you might want to try to port it. Um, you, you need to have physical access to the device to make this a fluent and, and um, effortless thing. Yeah. And it's still enough effort. So um, unless somebody ports the device or somebody donates a device for porting, um, yeah, we don't know when it will happen. It can yeah. happen. So basically, those things are not planned. They're not mapped out much. They're yeah. happy exactly. little accidents that uh, people just notice that there is a phone and they port over Ubuntu Touch to it, and that's pretty much it. And the same, I mean, I did the Pixel 3a port, and that's just because I got the device um, and I ported Ubuntu Touch over to it, and yep. I did it. So please go ahead. If you want to have it on your next Pixel phone, please go ahead and do it as well. Uh, there's nothing holding you back other than maybe fear of documentation. <laughs> <laughs> or fear of lack of documentation. <laughs> maybe, <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so definitely, you know, we, we do have we do have some some documentation here, but it's out of date. So, so yeah. uh, every now and then and other things don't apply anymore. Um, but if you go to our ubports underscore porting uh, Telegram group, you will find someone who can help you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, that were also great questions, even though, uh, of course, some of them we answered over the time, but there's still shows the relevance and the importance of those things. Yeah? Of course, yeah. people want to have latest devices. They want to have something that you may, might be able to buy in a store. Yeah. Um, still there, I must say, um, Vola phones are great. Um, you can buy them with UT pre-installed. And um, that's something that yeah makes perfect sense. Um, if you don't want to fiddle with porting and with, with uninstalling yourself. Yeah, yeah. I, I always I always compare it to, well, Android phones have Android hardware. iPhones have iPhone hardware. We just happen to make use of um, Android hardware, but really the, the complete package is an Ubuntu phone. And for that, someone needs to custom tailor it. And that's pretty much what porting is custom tailoring the software and the experience to a, a, a phone um, that is out there. And if you like, if you like what lineage is, is doing and you would like to apply the same uh, concepts to Ubuntu touch in that sense with community members doing ports, then please go ahead. We, we would like to see that. Yeah. And of course, Fairphone. Um, the thing with Fairphone is that 
we are also working to team up with Fairphone to do the same so that you could buy a pre-installed Fairphone in the shop. Mm. And um, things are going so-so, I must say. To be yeah. honest, um, there are still some roadblocks here. Um, and uh, we thought we can actually manage to get on the Fairphone 4 with Ubuntu Touch. It might be delayed until Fairphone 5. Just saying. Yeah. But still, it's not off the table. <laughs> exactly. And the uh, reason for that is mainly because um, the Fairphone guys are really moving fast. And at the time when we started to talk about Fairphone 4, it was already on the market. And uh, they are moving now to the next phone already. Yes, I can understand. They don't want to certify and make quality testing and all of that stuff for a phone yeah. that is already for some time on the market and then start to do the same for the next phone. And they don't even know and if they can trust us that everything works so that they really can get something out of it. Yeah, It's yeah. not that they want to sell only 10 phones and then nobody wants to have any more. So if we go there, yeah, we need to really convince them that we are good and we will try again. Anyways, um, I guess for the moment, anything still... Mm, I don't see much in the chat here. Um, yeah, also, no. seems like oh. we're pretty much good to go now. Yeah. Famous may last I, words. May I show you something again? Yes. Like, like the last few times uh, on the Q&A. Uh, I will just do a screen share here real quick because I want to show the progress of, of my little um, application that I mentioned earlier. And that is... Maybe I should resize this. Uh, can we see my screen already? There we go. Um, oh, no. Ooh, I'm not going to show no. you what is here. Uh, but what is there? Um, let's... Wait, wait a second. I have to remove the pixel plan thingy here. There <laughs> right. go. Yeah. Uh, so what we do have here is tied, actually. My uh, little WebAssembly C++ IDE that I showed earlier running on mac os and in turn i've also started a linux um based port desktop linux not only experimenting with it on the ubuntu touch side of things but also making sure that it works here with mac os and it has the whole damn shebang here uh, that you would expect from a little lightweight ide including let's stopping this here including some um, autocomplete, when I go here and I do some autocomplete stuff, there you go. Um, but also, and for that, uh, let me see, for that I will have to switch over to the iPad. There we go. Um, here is the same application running on the iPad and you can see here this little status thing because I'm now in the process of bringing Git integration into this thing so that you can use, uh, if you can, if you go here, you can already clone um, things from GitHub or from GitLab or everything through HTTPS only right now. Um, for example, the examples that I pulled here and another little change, we can run Python a uh, little WebAssembly enclosed Python um, program that, I mean, I don't know, let's do some REPL things, what you would do with a typical REPL thing. Uh, a plus B returns to... Do you see this? Have you seen this bug right now in the, in the, in the upper left-hand corner? This is annoying. This is one of those iPad OS bugs that makes me wonder, ah, we're not alone in the buggy land, huh? And um, yeah, there is also the ability to run just some random Python scripts. They're secured because first of all, they're running inside of another sandbox inside of the operating system sandbox. So WebAssembly is already uh, making sure that um, access to files is restricted in a way that is necessary, unless the developer or the, the, the user chooses to do otherwise. But this is pretty much the current state of it. You can create projects, you can do compilation with it, you can do many different things. It even has, if I open here the C++ file, 
and I add some random mistakes of formatting here. I save it and I go here and do auto format. It reverts it back to the prop formatting the way that you expect it. And it also has new libraries in there. So uh, libjpg, compression libraries. So everything that you would expect from a C++ based environment inside of WebAssembly is now doable. And with that, uh, how can I stop this stream here? Please go away. Uh, so, oh, I, I, wait, wait a second. I can do it for you. Okay. Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> got it. <laughs> we just had a, this tunnel thingy when you see what you're seeing and you see it again. It's funny. Yeah. <laughs> so, thank you. That that looks awesome. So, um, I think it's oh, a really neat way. Got, Fuse team got it. Fuse team got the idea. Tie in before time becomes an IDE for working on UT. AKA developing UT apps. Hey, there's mm. nothing stopping us from integrating clickable into this thing. Mm. Actually, it just needs clickable um, commands piped through to Docker and it does everything for you. Um, mm. You could, in theory, build applications for Ubuntu Touch with this when certain little pieces are there, but I would welcome to see them, right? Great. All right. Super. Okay, wonderful. We thought we will have a only short Q and A because there is nothing to talk about, and it seems we just filled up the hour, guys. So, <laughs> um, great. Um, yeah, it was really nice again um, to sit here on the on the hot chair, and um, nice talking with you, Alfred. About Hell yeah, as always. Nice things. We should go for a beer soon again. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, as long as the, the temperature is still 25 degrees at the end of October here. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy weather. Um, so next time, whenever that will be, either um, next week in two weeks or latest or so. I don't know what's your current feeling about uh, uh, we, Q&As. No, but, um, seems like we do it now. I mean, the current uh, like pace is every two weeks um, yeah. over the last three Q&A episodes. So we try to keep it up that way um for sure so uh thanks to paul again to uh bring over those uh notes to us and making sure that this episode really went through and like cut through like a hot knife through butter yes and yeah to Mario's get well soon uh we i hope to see the both of you also here uh as soon as possible Sure, so. and it, that's, that's actually true. So let's send Mario some some get well soon message um, if you can, if you want to do in a public channel or in private. Um, he can really uh, appreciate your support probably for he's going through kind of hard time now suddenly, and uh, but already recovering. So yeah, let's send him some wishes. Thanks everyone for listening in. Um, so probably you will be here in the next two weeks. You will be here for the next Q and A. I might oh. or might not. Let's see. <laughs> Maybe I just invite myself to the party and yeah. uh, have a great weekend. Remember also the next Q&A will be uh, one hour shifted already because we will be on winter time. Um, yes. So <laughs> as we know, 19, uh, 19 GMT means now then only 8 o'clock PM instead of 9 for the European fellows. Yeah. Very important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't miss the Q&A by one hour. Great. Have a great evening. Great weekend, everyone. Thanks for joining in. See you next time. Bye. Bye.